Good afternoon. Welcome to Grace Covenant Church and to noontime prayer and the reading of a psalm. Today we're going to be reading Psalm 24. I'm really glad that you're, you're here joining me today and my wife. My mom has a doctor's appointment today at 2, but I think we're going to cancel it. I still don't feel safe going out today. Our governor sequestered us through the end of May, and I was looking at the University, University of Washington's metric site. They have a statistical site with COVID-19, and they're suggesting that this stay-at-home order may go all the way through August 4th. We'll see. We're going to take it day, one day at a time, one month at a time. We do have a powerful weapon on our side, and that is prayer. Not the power of, of prayer itself, but the power of the one to whom we pray. That he hears us. He answers us. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. And sometimes the answer is wait. And sometimes, inexplicably, the answer is silence. But in the meantime, we pray. Because we know that the one who hears our prayers is all-powerful. And he loves us. And however he answers, he answers out of his great love for us and for this world. Let's pray. Kind and merciful Father, I just uh, again thank you for being able to gather with people today on Facebook Live, to be able to take some time and approach your throne of grace, seeking your guidance, seeking your counsel, seeking your discernment, seeking your love and peace, Lord. <clears throat> As I'm getting messages from people and posts and all the different things by which people are communicating with each other today. I see a lot of confusion, Lord. A lot of confusion because of the season we're in, that this is a pre presidential election year. And so politics gets mixed up in everything, Lord. And it's not just one side or the other. Politics gets mixed up in everything. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give us clear discernment. First of all, to remember that we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom and not the kingdom of this earth. I pray that as we are citizens of this heavenly kingdom, you would give us strength and wisdom and even words to speak truth to all parties, to discern what is good in all parties and to discern the evil in all parties. We know that according to 1 John, the apostle John said that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one, but we are children of God. Not that the people in the world who are under the power of the evil one are our enemies, Lord, but they've been living in the enemy's camp. But as children of God, Lord, those who have entrusted our lives to you, we pray for clear vision, clear understanding, not influenced by the wisdom of this world, but we have the mind of Christ, Lord, and I give you praise for that. We have the mind of Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So when we have questions and when we have confusion and we have when we have politics entering everything regarding COVID-19 now, instead of reasoning with our own perspective, may we approach the throne of grace seeking out the mind of Christ and his wisdom. Let us see this world through your eyes. May we see this world through the cross. 
because you so love the world that you gave your only son that whoever believes in him, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, have eternal life. You didn't die just for a certain set of people. You died for the whole world. You love the whole world. And so help us to see politicians on both sides, Lord, through your eyes. You loved President Obama and his family. You love them still. You have loved President Trump and his wife, Melania, and their family, and you love them still. You love our governors, whether Republican or Democrat. You might not love what they do, I know that, Lord, but you love them. And so, Father, I pray that you would draw us to our knees in this pandemic to pray for our leaders. We have a responsibility to fall, follow those in leadership today. Your word says so, as long as they're not asking us to do things that are immoral or against you. But Father, I pray that we would, you would draw us to our knees and that you would give us your heart for this world, that you would give us your heart for even these politicians, for Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell and their families and all the senators and House of Representatives and our governors and our state representatives and our state senators and our city officials and our county officials. Father, forgive us. We are so quick to demonize people not seeing them through the eyes of your loving and kind heart, who would give up your life for the entire world, who indeed gave us your only son, Jesus, that you might die on our behalf and that you might die on the behalf of every human being. Who will ever walk this planet. Help us to be conveyors of the good news that announces good news that which has already happened. You've already died. You've already forgiven the sins of the world. And yet we stand still guilty in our sin until we receive that free gift of the promise of life. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed, already passed from death, eternal death, into life, into eternal life. So, Father, give us this deep love for our politicians, even if they are on the other side of our comfortableness. There are so many voices out there clamoring. A cacophony of confusing voices, Lord. Let us listen to one voice, your voice. Again, I pray for discernment, Lord. I pray that you would make a way through all this confusion. I pray for the election. That the individual that you would desire would become president or would remain president. Beyond all of our requests, Lord, we again pray the garden prayer of Jesus. Not our will, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you realize who we are? We are citizens of heaven, children of the Most High God, chosen, holy, and dearly loved, beloved of the Father, redeemed, justified, acquitted, forgiven, loved, graced. Let's endeavor to be salt and light in the world. 
Well, we're here to read Psalm 24. It's a royal psalm talking about the king. So let's read it and we'll work through it together. I'm glad you stuck with me yesterday through Psalm 23. It was a very long uh, meditation, hour and a half. It's probably a record for me. But I really enjoyed doing it, looking at those stories, immersing ourselves in the stories of the gospel, in the events of the gospel, in the accounts of Jesus' life and of his grace and his love. Psalm 24. Be reading from the New American Standard Bible. It's a Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and it established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And so we come to Psalm 24. It's a Psalm of David. We're not told anything other than, than that. They call this a royal psalm because it regards the king. But I actually call it a messianic psalm because as I read it and I prayed about it and the Lord spoke to me, I, have, I can't see how this can apply to a human being, this psalm. And in the end, we find very clearly that, that it applies to Yahweh, to the Lord. To Jesus. So let's work through it. Psalm 24 verses 1 and 2, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. And so we begin with these two verses that remind us that all creation belongs to the Lord. He created it, so he owns it. In, in behind me there, you'll see, a, over on this side, you'll see a paper crane. I made that paper crane. I own that paper crane. In the same way, Jesus, through Jesus, we know that Jesus is the Lord. I'm not going to revisit that. But anytime we see Lord, it means Yahweh, the name Yahweh. And Jesus says, I'm that guy. I'm Yahweh, for which they wanted to stone him, as we saw yesterday. And so here, the psalmist is reminding us that Everything in the earth, its inhabitants, all its peoples are the Lord's. We're his. In a sense, we're his property. He created us. We're his. And it says, for he founded, founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Something, some people think that this is that old view that the world was a disc floating on water. I don't think so. I, I, I like to interpret the Bible with the Bible. And so I thought, where does it talk about it's founded upon the seas? And we go back to Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, which fits in with this whole notion that the earth is the Lord's. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was for formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. Hmm. Darkness was over the surface of the waters, over the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So whatever scientific view you have or non-scientific view you have, according to Genesis at the very beginning, what we had was water. 
I'm just going to leave it at that. At that. I'm not going to go into scientific arguments or poetic arguments. Or There's a lot of different thought on this. There's evolutionary creationists, which I can't agree with. There's bio biosphere people, who people who believe that God created the biosphere. There's young earth, young earth people and old earth people. The point is, in this part of the psalm, is that the Lord owns it because he created it. And this beautiful imagery, the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And so right there you have God, the Father, God, the Holy Spirit. And then we find that God spoke creation into being. He used words. And in the mystery of the Trinity, we find out that that word is Jesus himself. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, verses that mirror Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we read, in the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Who is the word? Later on in, in John, just a few verses later, we find out that the word is Jesus. So in the beginning was Jesus, and, the, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Do you hear that? All things came into being through Jesus. He was the agent of creation. And nothing came into being that has come into being apart from him. That doesn't leave out anything. This verse, these verses tell us so clearly that Jesus was coexistent with the Father in the mystery of the Trinity. One being, three persons, I love that idea that God is love. I mean, it's not just an idea. It's a reality of who he is in his character. God is love. But because God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Father loves the Son, has entrusted all things into the Son's hands. The Son reveals the Father. The Holy Spirit directs us to the Son and gives us the words of the Father, illuminate Scripture, and they all love each other. And so in the very heart of one God, is a relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just as my body has a spirit, a soul, and a body. My body is physical. I have it. I mean, I, I live in it. My soul is my mind, will, and emotions. That's what I listen to, and, and my thoughts, and my feelings, what I respond to. So do you. And then we have our spirit, and that's a part of us that listens to your thoughts, that innermost being. And when you're born of the spirit, you have a living spirit within you. And so the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who is the Lord? But Jesus, the creator. That's what we're be being told in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Again, we're told in Colossians Chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, by the Apostle Paul. For by him all things were created, for by Jesus. If you read earlier in chapter verses 13 and 14. For by Jesus all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So in my shelf in the other room, I have a New World Interlinear, which is a Jehovah Witness document. I paid good money for it. And in their Interlinear, they have in their text, he created all other things, and they put in the word other four times to say that, God, that Jesus himself was a created being. But in their own Interlinear, which has the English on one side and the Greek on the other, if you go to the Greek and look at it, it has the English above it. There's obviously no word other in that text. They quit using it. Uh, so I'm, I love these people when they come to my door and I try to reason with them and show them that Jesus is truly God, that he is one with the Father, one God, body, soul, and spirit, if you will. 
So Jesus is the creator. He created you. He knit you together while you were yet in your mother's womb. He gave you a unique DNA that will never be repeated. Your DNA is amazing. It has so much information in it, calculated, planned, designed information. That's much like a computer program, only instead of using just two bits, zero and one, it uses four bits, four chemical uh, letters, A, G, C, and T, I think it is. And if they were to take your unique DNA and read one character a second, it would take 96 years to read the blueprint, the manual for who you are. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Jesus made you. He knows you. Intimately, he has the hairs on your head numbered. I looked in the shower this morning and there was a bunch of hair in the, in the hair trap. I thought, man, I'm losing my hair. He knows the number of hairs I lost today. So same with you. He's more powerful, more, more understanding, more knowledgeable than we give him credit for. So the earth is the Lord, the earth is Jesus and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. So then we move from declaring, reminding us that the world is God's, that the world is the Lord's. Then he makes an inquiry about who has the qualifications to ascend the holy hill. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Again, Yahweh. And again, extrapolating to Jesus. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. So the question is, is who has the qualifications to ascend this hill? And they're talking about the hill of Jerusalem, Moriah, Mount Moriah, where God commanded Abraham to go and to offer up his son Isaac and as they are ascending Mount Moriah this very hill that Jerusalem was built on the very hill where uh, where Jesus was crucified Isaac asked Abraham but father where's the lamb where's the sacrifice where's the animal for the sacrifice and Abraham in great faith said God will provide the lamb God will provide a lamb. When they get up to the top and he's bound his son, ready to kill him, raises the knife, the angel stops him. And what do they find? They find a ram in the thicket. Not a lamb, a ram. That's an adult male sheep. A couple thousand years later, Jesus shows up on the shore of the Jordan River, walking along. And John the Baptist... John the Baptist, baptizing in the river, sees Jesus coming along and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So this hill was holy, not just because it was to be, it was to be the place where the temple would yet be built. It hadn't been built in David's time. But the Ark of the Covenant was situated in a, in a tent on the top of Mount Moriah in the city of Jerusalem. And so this question, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? Who may stand before the Ark of the Covenant? And later on it would be who could stand in the Holy of Holies? And he gives us the qualifications for that. I think there's a deeper meaning in this psalm that has to do with who may ascend the holy hill of Mount Moriah. to give his life as a sacrifice, the once and for all sacrifice that will put away sin from us, that will forgive the entire world. Not being a universalist, he offers it as a free gift to us, but for the believing. And then he answers his, well, one, one more thing, who may stand in his holy place? The priests could. But they had to do sacrifices for themselves before they could approach the Ark of the Covenant. If they didn't, if they touched the Ark of the Covenant, we have accounts that reveal that anyone who touched it accidentally 
died immediately. And it has to do with the depth of our deprav depravity and our sin. So we ask the question, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place to worship God, to be that priest? And David's answer is, he who has clean, clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. So he who has clean hands, that is ritually clear, clean, but it means morally clean hands. Our hands are used often for sin. Sin begins in the mind, but it's worked out in our hands and through our hands. So oftentimes, right? He who has clean hands, it's also our mouth oftentimes, but he who has clean hands and a pure heart, a heart of integrity, a heart that is not adulterated with deception and double-mindedness and sin, a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, I'm not sure why this translation w went with falsehood. It, it does mean falsehood, but it's, it means to idolatry. Who has not lifted his soul up to, to idols. Israel was surrounded by idolatrous nations, horribly idolatrous nations, that practiced human sacrifice, that practiced temple prostitution, all kinds of deeply wicked and evil things. And so they were warned in the Ten Commandments not to worship other gods. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. In our culture, we come along with shows like American Idol. We have our idols. Our chief idol in this culture, well, there's the idol of wealth, the idol of pleasure. But I think our main idol, it's quite clear, is the idol of self. Just believe in yourself. All you need is yourself. We have all these words that spin off of it. Self-realization, self-fulfillment, self-actualization. Self. And in like kind, we have the sacrifice that matches whom we worship. And that's abortion. 66 million people, uh, little children killed in their mother's womb. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted his soul up to an idol and has not sworn deceitfully, who has not lied, who has not made oaths. God very much cares about our word. He wants us to, be, to have integrity not only in our actions, but in our words, in our promises. So many years ago when I first arrived at Bremerton, to what was First Covenant Church then, I was invited to Promise Keepers. I hadn't heard about them. And as I went and thought about Promise Keepers, I realized we're not Promise Keepers. We are Promise Breakers. And over a six or seven year period, Promise Keepers petered out. And all those men, men who had made those seven promises by now have broken those promises. Because I only know of one Promise Keeper So who fits this bill? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. I again return to Romans. Verses 10 through 12. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who seeks God or no one who understands. No one who seeks God. All have turned away. Together they have become worthless. Together we have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And this is all quoted from the Hebrew scriptures, from the Psalms and from the law. Paul's point is, your own law says that no one is righteous. No one can stand. So in answer, he who has, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who may stand in his holy place? Paul's answer is no one. There is no one good. Even Jesus said that when the rich young ruler came running up to him 
He says to Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, almost like a slap in the face, says, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God alone. Even Jesus would not claim goodness living as a perfect human being. And yet, when I look at Jesus himself, he's the only one that, who fits this bill. He has clean hands. He has a pure heart. He's never worshipped any idols. And he's never sworn deceitfully when he was on this planet. So I read in Philippians 2, 5, and 6, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. I quoted this one verse from the New King James because the other versions for some reason, reverse the meaning. New King James Version gets this one right. I've checked this out. I don't think people want to understand what this says. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, now we're not in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. If Jesus considered himself to be equal with God, that would not be considered robbery because he is equal with God. But he didn't consider himself equal with God. Well, he, he didn't consider it robbery to do so. If you and I consider ourselves to be equal with God, that's robbery. We're taking away from God's exalted and high position and who he is, his character. And so what verse 5 and 6 are saying is that Jesus is equal with God. And then moving on to 7 and 8. But he emptied himself, and see the contrast between not considering it robbery to be considered equal with God, now I've returned to New American Standard Bible. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. you get that? Jesus emptied himself, and it means that he emptied himself of the privileges and power of his deity, and taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. So God declothed himself of his godhood in the person of Jesus came to this earth <clears throat> and clothed himself in human flesh and lived as a perfect human being <clears throat> didn't live out of the resources of his being God because he has emptied himself he lives as the true human being should live completely dependent on the Holy Spirit trusting the Father at every turn being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So when I see this verse say, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? Well, there was more than one holy place on that hill. There was the holy place of the Ark of the Covenant. There was the holy place that would yet be built, the Holy of Holies, the holy place and then the inner holy place of the Holy of Holies, where only one Priests could go in once a year, and he'd have to make a sacrifice for himself before going in. And they actually tied a rope around his foot just in case he died. While he was in there, they could drag him out. But there's another holy place on Mount Moriah. That holy place is on the hill Gol Golgotha. That holy place where Jesus gave up his life, spilt his blood, gave of himself that you and my I might be forgiven that you and I might live forever that you and I might be redeemed and acquitted and justified Jesus is the only one I know who fits this bill he who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and not sworn deceitfully we're told so in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin, Jesus, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I chose the NIV because it's actually a whole bunch of, of personal pronouns. He made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So I took out the pronouns and put in the the, the actual reference to those pronouns. God made Jesus, God made Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us, to be sin for you and I. 
to be sent to become the sin of the entire world so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness that moral health of God there's this exchange a transaction we bring our sin offer it to God he's already taken it actually and he gives us in exchange our righteousness or his righteousness our righteousness is as filthy rags, according to Isaiah. Do you hear this? God made Jesus, the Lord, who had no, no sin, to be sin for us, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? Jesus, the one with clean hands and a pure heart, who had no sin, who had not lifted up his soul, to idolatry and who has not sworn deceitfully. Moving on in Psalm 24 to verses 5 and 6. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of, of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Selah. Pause. Think about this. Ponder this. So this gets a little bit hard to translate because... The he there, I'm maintaining, is referring to Jesus, and yet Jesus is the Lord. He shall receive a blessing th from the Lord. Well, this is Jesus emptied, emptied of the privileges of his deity, emptied himself of being God and took on the form of man. And so he still worships the Father, Yahweh, while in the mystery of the Trinity is Yahweh. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord. And what is that blessing that Jesus received? In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. What joy did Jesus not already have? He was majesty of majesties, king of kings, lord of lords. What joy wasn't his already in this family of the Trinity, one God, in a perfect relationship of, lo of love within his own being. Well, the joy set before him for which he endured the cross is you and I. The joy of having us with him forever. The joy of redeeming us, of setting us free, and our loving him because he first loved us freely and without reservation because of his great love with which he's loved us. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. He was already righteous. But because of what Jesus did, we receive a righteousness from God. Not on the basis of the law or on the works of the law, but the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. It's Philippians 3. and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So even Jesus was saved. He was delivered after he died from death and from the moral corruption that he had become. And he was returned to a state of righteousness. And he was resurrected. He was saved by God the Father. We think that Jesus raised himself. Oh, God, it says in Ephesians chapter 1 at the end of the chapter, that God raised him from the dead. Can you imagine that? Jesus, the Son of God, who had been eternally coexistent with the Father in the mystery of the Trinity, now faces death where he will be dead. And he has to be reliant on the Father, trust the Father, have faith in the Father to resurrect him from the dead. Of course, they were one in spirit, one in the unity of, of God. There is one God, hero Israel, there is one God. Then it says, this is the generation of those who seek him. That word generation, or that word th this can also mean such. So such is the generation of those who seek him. And that word generation, let me turn on my phone, it turned off on me here. I have the definition all up here. I think the, generate, the, the meaning of it is characterized by quality, generation, character, 
characterized by quality, condition, class of men. So it's getting at the quality of the generation of people who seek him. Such is the generation, the quality of men and women, of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. And Jacob there isn't referring to the man Jacob, but to Israel. It's another name of Israel. And so I thought, okay, who, who, what generation has had the quality to meet those requirements of how to, having a pure heart? And so I think about the history of Israel. I think of Adam and Eve who, because of both of their disobedience, they allowed sin to enter the world. And by allowing sin to enter the world, so did death. Chapter 5, I think it is, of Genesis talks about an Adam, that whole genealogy of an Adam gave, or Adam, uh, how does it go? The genealogy about who fathered who, and all through it, and he died, and he died, and he died. Except for Enoch, who was taken because he, he walked with God. But, and he died. Death taints the entire book of Genesis. Cain and Abel, death. The destruction in the flood, death. The Tower of Babylon, God separating everybody out and now dealing with human beings individually, not as groups. Abraham died, and it was full of sin. Jacob died, full of sin. Dirty twister. Isaac played favorites with his sons. He died. The 12 sons of Joseph, more corrupt than their fathers and their forefathers. Horribly corrupt. They killed off a whole city of men, tricked them into making a covenant with them by having them circumcise themselves, which was a sign of God's covenant with Abraham. And so he was. they were asking them to come into the covenant with God only to use that as a ploy to murder them in their beds or murder them when they were at their most painful time after the circumcision. They killed off a whole town of men. And then we see the Hebrew people. They're delivered with the great miracles, the, the plagues, and through the coming through the Red Sea, only to complain and grumble, so much so that they have to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. And Moses himself doesn't get to go into the promised land because he too loses his temper in a moment of passion and, and is disallowed from going in. And once they get in, they're commanded to destroy, put to the ban, the cities in which they are taking over. And you have the city of Jericho, this wonderful victory for the Israelites. Then you have the story of the city of Ai. And somebody has already disobeyed. And then they're making covenants with groups, not doing what God is telling them. Going after the idols of, their, of the neighboring countries and the neighboring peoples. The book of Judges is a constant cycle of the Israelites going after the foreign gods God bringing in an oppressing nation to oppress them for a long period of time. Finally, the Israelites calling out to God, please save us. God sends them a judge who delivers them. They have a period of peace in which they worship God, and then they slide right back into the idolatry. And then they ask God for a king when God himself is their king. And Samuel's devastated by it, but God says, no, they're not sinning against you, they're sinning against me. But wait till they get a king and they'll cry out because of the cruel oppression the king brings upon them. And then look at the kings. You have King Saul, very tall, handsome man, who disobeys God. And then when he disobeys him, still wants to hear from God. So he conjures up Samuel through a medium, through a witch, the witch of Endor. In his place, we're brought in brought in David, the shepherd boy, who has the heart of God, a man after God's own heart. And yet the story of Bathsheba, he has, 
He impregnates Bathsheba when he sees her bathing on the roof and calls for his servants to bring her to him. And then she gets pregnant because of their tryst. And so he arranges Uriah to come back to the city so he can sleep with his wife. So then Uriah will think that it's his own kid. But Uriah is a man of integrity. Compared to David, he's a man of integrity who sleeps at the temple gate or at the palace gates. Won't go into his wife. So then David allows for him to be killed and murders the man. David wanted to build a temple for God on Mount Moriah, but God told him, no, you have too much blood on your hands for it, for it to be built by you. Along call, comes Sol Solomon, David's son. And you think, finally, we have the whitest man who's ever lived. He's commanded essentially three things. The kings are commanded. Don't go after Hort. Uh, chariots and horses, don't amass for yourself lots of gold, and don't go after foreign wives. Solomon breaks the whole thing. He amasses for himself thousands of chariots and horses. He has 300 foreign wives and 700 concubine, a thousand basically wives. And he amasses for himself large amounts of gold. And because of his disobedience, the nation is divided between the northern nation of Israel and the southern nation of Israel and southern nation of Judah. Judah has three or four good, good kings. Josiah, Hezekiah, I think there's a couple others. Israel, northern kingdom, has no good kings. They go from bad to worse. worse. Ahab, Jezebel, I mean, you name the whole list of them. They all do evil in this in the sight of the, of the Lord, going after idolatry, going after the Baals, going after the Astros. So finally, in 722 BC, God allows for the Assyrian nation to come in and cart Israel off into exile. And then in 586 BC, God allows Babylon, draws Babylon down to cart off Judah into exile. Judah's somewhat restored to the land 70 years later. Israel has never been restored. We're still waiting for that day. There are more Israelites coming to Israel today than ever before in all of history. But we, you, you see the, the, the taint of sin and the taint of death. There's this descent of man that starts in the Garden of Eden. And it taints every human being that has ever lived. It's tainted your life and it's tainted my life. We know this full well, don't you? So now we get through the 400 years of silence. And Jesus appears on the scene and he call, call, calls 12 disciples to follow him. Being representative of the 12 tribes. So now we're the tribes didn't work. They failed. The kings didn't work. They failed. The judges, the people under the judges, they failed. Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob, they failed. The 12 brothers failed. Even Moses failed. The people who came out of Egypt failed, who saw the, that great power of God. And now we're left with 12. He's, we, we winnowed it down, whittled it down to 12 men. Now let me show you what happens to these 12 men. Here's Judas. While, he was, while Jesus was still speaking, behold, a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the 12, was preceding them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him. That had been the forearranged signal by which he would betray Jesus. He would betray Jesus with the kiss of love, with the kiss of friendship. Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? We know the rest of the story. Jesus, Judas is overcome with the knowledge that he has betrayed innocent blood, and so he goes out and hangs himself. What about the other ten disciples? We're told in Mark 14, 50, simply, and they all left him and fled. They fled into the darkness. After promising, as we saw yesterday, after promising that they too would not deny Jesus and that they would follow him to the death. And as soon as the Roman cohort and the, the temple guard came from, the, from Caiaphas, the ten disciples flee. 
the last hope of the nation of Israel. These 12 men. And then bold Peter, who promised, even if all these others fall away, I won't fall away. And Jesus says, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. But, and so we pick up the story, but Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about, the third denial. And immediately while he was speaking, a rooster crowed. Judas thoroughly failed. The ten disciples fled into the night. And Peter, even when Jesus had told him he would do this, instead of believing, he denies his Lord three times. And he goes out and weeps bitterly, meeting Jesus' eyes in the firelight of a charcoal fire. And so the, the message of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Scriptures is this descent of man until you get down to the twelve and now you're you're left with the one who is ascending the hill who is this qualified generation of those who seek him who seek your face even Jacob well Jacob now the nation of Israel has been whittled down to just one man Jesus And we continue in Psalm 24, verses 7 and 8. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Well, this is clearly talking about the Lord coming into the gates. And those gates would have been the gates of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. Those ancient doors, which they closed at night. Lift up your head, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. It's not talking about himself here, David. Certainly is not talking that he would be the King of glory. Who is the King of glory? He asks this rhetorical question and then answered it, answers it himself. The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. And again, we have the word Yahweh there. Again, we can directly apply it to Jesus. Jesus, strong and mighty. Jesus, mighty in battle. And so on the day, that Sunday, when Jesus rides into Jerusalem through those very gates, here comes the King of glory. And we can read those verses in Mark chapter 11, verses 7 through 10. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, and he sat on it. When they brought the colt to Jesus, the anticipation of the Israelites of that day, of the Hebrew people, of the Jews living in Ju Ju Judea and Jerusalem, was that when the Messiah would come, he would come in on a mighty war, white war horse. And he would come in and overthrow the Roman Empire, reestablish the glory of Solomon's kingdom, reestablish their place in the world. But instead of a war horse, he comes, comes in on the foal of a don donkey, just this little colt. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is a coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Right there we're told the secret of what they were looking for. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. What did... The, what were their expectations of King Jesus riding in? Not on a war horse, though, on this donkey. He kind of got that wrong, Jesus, but we'll, we'll, we'll let you slide there. The expectation is that that coming kingdom is to, to be established right then. And it's going to be the kingdom of David restored, that promise that that kingdom would, would reign forever. Hosanna in the highest. Praising God for this coming king. They, they were saying he's the Messiah. He's the king coming to save us. But they had it all wrong. Because he wasn't coming to set up a kingdom on this earth. He was coming to offer up his life. To climb the hill of Moriah. To stand in the holy place. And be crucified so that we might live, so that we might be forgiven.
These same crowds were shouting Hosanna a week later. Actually, that was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Five days later. Mark chapter 15, verses 12 through 14. After Pilate has wanted to release Jesus, after he was handed to Pilate by the Sanhedrin and by Caiaphas, he discerns that he's innocent and wants to release him. So he figures he'll choose this really evil guy, Barabbas, who was a zealot, who was a murderer, who had tried to overthrow the Roman government, most likely in some local skirmish of rebellion. He figured, I'll get this really evil guy and then we'll present Jesus. And of course, they're going to choose Jesus. They were just shouting Hosanna. It doesn't say that, but I think that's in the connotation. So then he asked, what, after they have shouted, we want Barabbas, we want Barabbas. His plan failed. What shall I do then with the one you call King of the Jews? Here he is, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Who shall, what shall I do then with the one you call King of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they didn't answer that. All they shouted all the more, but they shouted all the louder, crucify him. These crowds who had the expectation that Jesus would overthrow the Roman Empire when he didn't, now they just want him gone. We're moving on to the next Messiah. Not realizing that this was and is the one and only true Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Majesty of Majesties, the King of Glory. Again, we repeat these words, lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. The Lord who commands the angel armies of heaven. He is the King of glory. I think about glory in the New Testament. In John chapter 17, verse 1 and 2, after Judas has betrayed him, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. And so in the Gospel of John, the glorification of Jesus is the cross of Jesus. We see his highest good, his glory, on the cross. Who is the King of glory? Jesus himself. And what's that glory? It's that all-giving heart of God who is the Lord, the Lord, compassion and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, and yet by no means leaving the guilty unpunished. And we saw all of that glory met in Jesus on one of our earlier psalms. The glory of the cross. He does not seek his own. He does not keep a record of wrong suffered. His love never fails us. And then we move on. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. Why do I bring up this verse? Because it talked about who can stand in the holy place? For David, it would have been the Ark of the Covenant. For Jesus, it was that holy place of Golgotha where he offered up his life. But it was also the temple, the Holy of Holies, by which we were separated from the presence of God because of our sin. And again, we're only one high priest a year could go in once a year on the Day of Atonement and go into the Holy of Holies and bring in the blood of the goat and put it on the mercy seat. Because of Jesus' death, that holy of holy, that holy place disappeared. Jerusalem is no longer a holy place in that sense. You and I have become the holy of holies. 
We who have believed in Jesus have been filled with the presence of Yahweh, have been filled with the presence of his spirit, have been filled even to the fullness of God. Who can ascend the mountain? Who has the character to ascend the holy hill? From this generation, who has the character to be able to meet the qualifications? It's Jesus alone. He ascends the mountain, the holy hill, gives up his life at the moment of his death. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. And we now have gained access to the throne of grace. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And by Jesus' death, we are brought near to God. We're given forgiveness, eternal life, redemption. All those words that I talk about so often, they're not just words, they're reality, folks. My life's been redeemed. If you've entrusted your, to yourself to Christ, if you believed in his name, your life has been redeemed. You have been forgiven. You've been acquitted of all wrongdoing as if you never did it. You've been promised eternal life, and the promise keeper is sure to keep his promise. He never lies. He never breaks a promise. So let's again read the psalm. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob, even Jesus. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Thank you for joining me today. I don't know what you think of that interpretation, but that's where the Lord led me. It's quite clear to me that none of us have those qualifications in of ourself, save Jesus himself. I'm so grateful for what he's done for us, that he is the king, that he is my king, that he is your king, that he is the king of glory, the glory which we see on the cross by which he redeems the world and by which he offers that free gift of eternal life for all those who would believe. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for today. I thank you for everyone gathered. I thank you for your watchful care over us, Lord. I thank you that you are ever present to us. I pray that you would help us to understand this psalm in its depths, that Jesus is the only one from out of the nation of Israel who meets the requirements of Psalm 24, who ascends the hill in order to give up his life.
I give you praise, Lord, for our Lord Jesus Christ. I give you praise, Lord, for what you've done in our life, what you're, you are now doing, and what you are yet to do. I thank you for the gift of life. I thank you for the gift of eternal life. I thank you for the shed blood of Jesus. I thank you for hope eternal. I thank you for understanding surpassing peace. I thank you for the immeasurable, boundless, unconditional love of Christ. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thanks for joining me. Tomorrow I'll be back for Psalm 25. And then Friday I'm taking off. Um, I have some other obligations or some other events tomorrow after my presentation or the broadcast at noon. And the next week we're going to move to our Wednesday and Thursday only for the uh, Psalms. I, got, I have the annual meeting coming up with a lot of work to, to prepare for the annual meeting on Sunday. I think it's the 17th. So, But tomorrow, be back at noon with Psalm 25. Thank you so much for joining me today. We have a blessing from Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless you. Yahweh bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In this trying time of the pandemic with so much confusion going on, may the Lord give you peace. Amen.